everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back, everyone. Today we are going to look at a paper comparing biologic mesh versus synthetic mesh for contaminated ventral hernias, which was recently published in JAMA Surgery. It's a slightly shorter episode than usual. We couldn't bring your presentation um, this time considering a teaching topic, but we'll uh, make it up for you for next time. Stay tuned. So the paper that we're presenting today is called Biologic versus Synthetic Mesh for a Single Stage Repair of Contaminated Ventral Hernia Repairs. It's a randomized clinical trial, and we've taken the article from JAMA Surgery, which was published on the 19th of January. Um, below is the link for the abstract, and the PubMed ID is also there. My name is Aslam, and my colleague is Gio, as you uh, all know. Excellent. So let's start with a little bit of background about this paper. So we know that ventral hernia repair is a, a very common general surgical procedure actually in the States. It, the estimated cost related to this uh, procedure is 3.2 billion per annum, uh, which is quite a lot of money. And we do know that biological meshes in the context of ventral hernias have been considered traditionally uh, suitable for contaminated hernias, particularly clean contaminated and contaminated procedures. Um, they uh, are traditionally considered uh, safer in that context. However, data from the literature shows how morbidity associated with the mesh and recurrence rate seems to be actually higher in using a biologic mesh. And according to the authors, no rigorous study looking at the safety and efficacy of biological meshes to date has been conducted concerning this particular topic. So the authors hope to shed some light on this. And they particularly focus on clean contaminated and contaminated procedures, as you can see on the table on the right. Uh, the authors hypothesize that the synthetic mesh would result in superior hernia recurrence risk with similar safety and lower cost compared to the with the biologic mesh. So essentially what they were saying was they feared that the permanent synthetic mesh would lead to chronic infections and further complications or a uh, reoperation. Let's have a look at the population involved in this study. So uh, the authors included adults undergoing single stage repair of clean contaminated or contaminated ventral hernias. Um, in this case, they consider adults 21 years old or older. Uh, they also deemed uh, necessary hernia defect of uh, nine square centimeters or above. They only included, as mentioned earlier on, class two or three CDC uh, contaminated wounds. Uh, only elective single stage repairs. Uh, in order for the patient to be eligible, uh, intraoperative fascia closure had to be achieved. So no bridging was allowed, basically. And obviously the patients need to be uh, accepting both meshes before um, being put to sleep and, and having a general anesthetic uh, because they are randomized um, intraoperatively. Uh, a variety of exclusion criteria uh, are used by the authors, uh, including malnutrition, low albumin, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just put in there a couple that are particularly relevant. They exclude the patient uh, with a BMI over 45 and patients that were smoking within one month of surgery. So our PICO question for intervention and comparison uh, specifically was patients were in, uh, uh, randomized to retromuscular synthetic or biologic mesh at the time of fascial closure. The biological mesh was non-cross-linked porcine dermis, which was the current standard. And the intervention was a synthetic mesh, which they used a medium weight polyproline as, uh, as the intervention. Back to you, Gio. Right, and let's have a look at the outcome. So the outcome that they considered uh, as a primary outcome, as a measure of efficacy, is hernia recurrence at two years. Uh, this is measured with a mixture of clinical criteria, radiological criteria, and self-reported criteria. Clinical criteria are obviously examination by a member of the team. Uh, radiological is by a CT uh, or by an ultrasound. Uh, there doesn't seem to be uh, even going through the appendix is a specific protocol to guide radiological um, decision making, whether a patient goes for ultrasound or CT and at what point in time. And self-reported uh, using a hernia recurrence inventory is a further method that they use. Uh, 
a new currency inventory was uh, apparently introduced um, a few years ago in the States. And um, uh, the original validation study determined that if patients experience a bulge uh, at the area of the previous hernia, and they report that uh, apparently this is quite accurate in uh, actually identifying hernia recurrence. Uh, patients that are positive on recurrence inventory gets offered a radiological further assessment. Secondary outcomes that the author looked at are mesh safety, 30-day um, hospital direct cost, prosthetic cost, and quality of life. Uh, concerning the primary outcome, this is a superiority trial um, and is designed based on a pre-assumed difference between the two treatment in terms of recurrence rate of 9 versus 29% for synthetic versus biologic. So with the synthetic mesh being superior. Ball to you, Aslam. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit, bit about the study design in the method section. So the type and the subtype of, uh, of the design was it's a randomized control trial and it's single blinding, which I'll talk a little bit about further below. The setting were five academic medical centers in the US specializing in abdominal wall reconstruction. These are tertiary centers. All the clinicians were highly skilled, the most junior being a clinical fellow and above. The period of enrollment, the trial or the surgery started between December 2012 until April 2019. They were followed up at specific points, such as day one, 30, six months, 12 months, and two years. So the last patient was seen in April 2021. Uh, some methods were adopted to reduce the bias. Uh, so patients were enrolled by physicians and research personnel from clinics um, uh, from these centers. Randomization sequence was generated using um, by, by a statistician. Um, central um, concealed randomization scheme was housed uh, in REDCAP. REDCAP stands for Research Electronic Data Capture, uh, and they used random number blocks. Uh, they tried to use minimization or stratification, uh, uh, allocation executed uh, by the research coordinators themselves. And then the patients were randomized in theaters one-to-one -one between synthetic and biological meshes immediately before mesh deployment. As I said, uh, it was a single blinded, so the investigators knew up until mesh placement, whereas the patients were blinded right up until the end of the conclusion of the study itself. Back to you, Gio. Right, let's start having a look at the results. So uh, in total, they had 253 um, patients enrolled, which is about what they expected to enroll based on the, their uh, patient sample size calculations. Uh, 126 were randomized to synthetic mesh and 127 to biologic mesh. And age uh, and gender distribution are as advertised. As you can see, they have a wonderful adherence to protocol. Every patient that's allocated to biologic mesh gets a biologic mesh. Every patient that's all allocated to synthetic mesh gets a synthetic mesh. Uh, and as you can see, their follow-up is actually uh, reasonably good, particularly at two years. They designed some interventions approaching the two-year um, follow-up point uh, whereby they were sending patients some reminders, um, which they didn't at uh, uh, six months at one year, and the increased follow-up at two years. Um, as you can see, patient characteristics were pretty similar between the two groups, uh, particularly considering um, conditions such as Crohn's or certicolitis, which would obviously make you catabolic and more likely to develop um, a wound complication, uh, as well as uh, history of uh, smoking. They don't go into much more details about um, how much smoking per se. Um, and uh, on the right side on the table, you can see a few um, intraoperative characteristics. It says intraoperative time, which as you can see, is pretty similar, uh, as well as access, which was uh, pretty much in 100% of the cases, uh, midline laparotomy, as you expect in a mental hernia. Uh, there's quite a few stomas um, in this cohort, uh, obviously accounting for the um, uh, source of contamination as well. Um, and of note, they talk about uh, enterotomies uh, as a source of contamination, which obviously um, is probably accidental that they do mean that the enterotomy stepped up the degree of contamination of the wound and the patients were included um, beforehand as a simple repair. We're talking about primary outcomes on this slide. Um, so efficacy was the primary outcome and efficacy um, in, in their, in their uh, discussion is essentially efficacy was measured by the two-year hernia recurrence rate. Um, so the hernia recurrence rate at two years was 13% overall for everyone. But when it was broken down to which type of mesh the patients had, you can see that there was a greater hernia recurrence rate with the patients who had the biologic mesh at 20.5%. 
whereas a, a synthetic group had only a 5.6% recurrence rate at two years point. So the synthetic mesh was significantly, uh, significantly reduced the risk of hernia recurrence. Um, as you can see, the hazard ratio, the 95% confidence interval, uh, as well as the p-value, p-value of less than 0.001 showed that there was a significant um, difference between the two groups. Back to you, Gio. Excellent. A uh, quick couple of my occur um, to uh, graphically highlight what we just discussed. So as you can see, uh, at 24 months, uh, there's uh, quite a visible difference between the biologic group and the synthetic group. Uh, obviously, they do have for some patients longer follow-up, uh, but as you can see, the population at risk after the 24 months, which is the um, formal end of the uh, RCT, um, goes significantly down. Um, Ball back to you. Thank you. So the secondary outcomes, um, one of the main secondary outcomes that they looked at was safety. The way that they, they defined safety was that uh, safety was measured by surgical um, site um, operations requiring procedural interventions, such as wound debridement, percutaneous drainage, etc. So when they looked at the safety, they found that there was no significant difference um, overall uh, in surgical site occurrence. Uh, requiring a procedural intervention between the two groups, whether it was the um, synthetic or the biologic mesh. They also looked at costs, and when they looked at the 30-day costs, uh, direct hospital costs, they found that the biologic group was much higher at 44000 nearly $45,000, whereas the uh, synthetic mesh group were only 17000 Again, there was a, a statistical significance there of a p-value of less than 0.001. With regard to specific direct cost of the meshes itself, the biologic mesh itself cost 21, over $21,000, whereas the synthetic mesh only cost just over $100. Again, there's a significance there. Uh, and one of the other uh, secondary outcomes that they, that they looked at was quality of life. Now they measured um, using uh, standardized scales, they measured quality of life at the beginning, so at the baseline and at various points, um, but they found that there was no difference, a significant difference between the groups at all at any time point, and they found that overall, um, all of the patients' quality of life improved um, by the end of the study, essentially. Back to you, Gio. Wonderful. Uh, so very briefly, uh, they looked at adverse events, uh, which is basically a composite measure of pretty much anything adverse that happens to the patient after their operation. And as you can see, uh, a lot of patients had uh, some degree of adverse event, up to 60%. These were uh, more common uh, in the biologic mesh group, again, 66 versus 51%. Um, and they also tended to be more severe uh, as um, in terms of overall uh, overall scoring. Uh, so so uh, looking at the, uh, the paper itself, these are some of the things that the um, authors reported themselves. So they said that they only used two materials specifically, as we said, polyproline and um, porcine dermis. Uh, they only looked at ventral hernias. Uh, the baseline characteristics were similar for all patients, but they hadn't power to control every single factor, essentially. Uh, they also suggested that the outcomes may not be reproducible in other centres. As mentioned, these were five tertiary centres with highly skilled surgeons, uh, and it may be difficult to apply these um, or get these results elsewhere, uh, and they readily declared that. Um, Follow-up at two years was good uh, and uh, similar for both groups, but rates were quite variable at the interim prior to two years. Um, also, the patients and assessors were blinded to treatment allocation, but there were points when um, some patients had to be evaluated clinically by physicians, and unfortunately, uh, it had to be done without blinding, owing, owing to some constraints. And finally, um, at the start of the trial, they could only get one specific size of biologic mesh. They don't then say at what point they were able to get various different sizes of biologic mesh, but they do declare that at the beginning, they only had a 20 by 30 centimeter biologic mesh available to them for the study. Few points uh, that we picked up uh, reading the paper and reading the supplementary material. Um, so there's no follow up beyond two years, um, at least for the vast majority of the patients enrolled. Um, this is, you know, part of the design of the trial itself. It's a limitation in, in the sense that uh, people can very much develop uh, recurrence of the hernias beyond two years. Um, but there's not much you can do about that. Um, something that the authors could have done something about, perhaps, and I found really difficult to wrap my head around despite reading the experimental material, is the way the radiological follow-up was organized. Um, 
a group of patients at a CT, a group of patients at an ultrasound, it's impossible to know based on the data they provide how many recurrences were actually pure radiological recurrences and not clinical recurrences. And what drove the choice between doing a CT versus an ultrasound? Um, on top of that, patient reported outcomes play a big role here. Um, as we mentioned, there's a hernia uh, recurrence inventory um, involved in the design of the study, uh, whereby patients can self report the presence of a recurrence. Uh, all these patients get offered a um, radiological investigation, which they can accept or decline. If they accept it and the radiological investigation says that they don't have a recurrence, obviously they don't have it. Uh, if um, the radiological investigation does not get carried out, they get assumed as having a recurrence anyway. Um, and it's not clear to me how patients are encouraged to report their recurrences. Um, a further limitation is related to the fact that they didn't include diabetes in the hazard model that uh, they created to um, support um, the, to correct for um, a variety of variables uh, when comparing synthetic versus biologic. And diabetes is a known risk factor, at least poorly controlled diabetes for recurrence. Uh, history of smoking is very poorly described and specified. Uh, being off smoking for a month doesn't make you an ex-smoker. Um, and patients might very well have been smoking after the operation has been done. Uh, and it's unclear whether um, <clears throat> this is recorded or not. There's still a parastomal hernia involved here. Obviously, the main reason for operating on this patient must have been uh, a ventral hernia component. Um, and patients that had a recurrence, but there was only parastomal, were actually not accounted as having a recurrence because the recurrence was not related to the uh, ventral hernia itself. Um, honestly, saying that um, radiological assessors are blinded, which the authors say that they are, it's probably not entirely true uh, for two reasons. Uh, where radiological assessors are surgeons involved um, in the trial, to a certain extent, uh, but pretty much everyone should be able to see if they're trained to interpret the CT scan as these surgeons are, um, whether there is a residual mesh or not, especially at two years. And the biological mesh would not be expected to be there anymore, while a synthetic mesh would be. Um, furthermore, they probably have access to reports, which would highlight if there's, potentially could highlight if there's a mesh or not. And finally, a quick point about uh, fascia closure. Now, uh, Achieving fascia closure is considered an inclusion criteria here. You don't really know if you're going to achieve fascia closure until you're actually doing the operation. Um, obviously, the authors achieved that in 100% of the cases. Um, and I must assume that they did not have any case where fascia closure were not possible and patients were therefore excluded because that would have been evident in the consort diagram. But it's not clear uh, from the text. And generally speaking, I found that a lot of these things, uh, including inclusion criteria, are not reported in the main text of the paper. You have to go through the supplementary material just to know the inclusion criteria and details. Um, so, ball back to you, Oslem, for conclusions. Can we move on to the next screen, please? So, in summary, the um, synthetic mesh showed a superior two year hernia recurrence risk in comparison to the biologic mesh, which Initially, that's not what they hypothesized at all. Uh, and they had similar safety profiles and quality of life profiles, but the synthetic mesh was significantly cheaper than the biologic mesh. Um, we've put a perspective table below for you to look at. We're not going to read each point, but we've tried to summarize the good and the bad points of the methodology and the clinical or domain expert areas. That's the end of our presentation. As usual, a brief summary of the discussion we had concerning the paper. Now, the first point we made relates to the concept of efficacy and effectiveness. The authors uh, highlight how they want to look at the efficacy of um, biologic meshes compared to synthetic mesh. Now, uh, efficacy generally refers to the performance of an intervention uh, in ideal conditions. Increased effectiveness relates to the efficacy of an intervention in real-world situations. The authors do use patient-reported outcomes as part of their primary outcome measures. That suggests that perhaps uh, 
they were looking uh, at effectiveness more than efficacy. However, it's worth noting that every study that we talk about stems in the spectrum between the, those two concepts. A further point that we made relates to the choice of designing this as a superiority trial in relationship to a lower occurrence rate in favour of synthetic mesh. Now, the authors highlight in a variety of points how um, there are also concerns associated with the safety of biologic mesh in terms particularly of adverse events and local complications. We therefore questioned whether this should have been designed as a non-inferiority trial, the primary outcome related to the safety of the mesh, and looking at a non-inferiority of a synthetic mesh versus biological mesh. Also because the authors quote a significantly lower occurrence rate for hernias in synthetic mesh shoes as part of their sample size calculations. Which brings us to a further point, which is quite relevant. Um, if uh, the literature published before this trial suggests that there is a difference in recurrence rate of 29% versus 9% of biologic versus synthetic mesh, uh, presenting such data to patients to enroll them um, in a study would raise the question whether why would they expose themselves to a higher, such a higher um, recurrence rate by the possibility of receiving a biological mesh rather than a synthetic mesh. And finally, we looked at the uh, relevance of patient reported outcomes in general. So, um, as you can probably guess from the presentation you just listened to, we felt that uh, using patient reported outcomes in the context of a primary outcome such as this could potentially result in um, some false positive or false negative report of recurrence. However, it is important to highlight how patients' involvement is becoming more and more relevant in the design of a randomized clinical trial, also uh, for accessing uh, resources such as financial support from charities and patients' associations. And ultimately, there's always an argument about the relevance of a clinician opinion versus a patient opinion. Ultimately, the patient is the one having the recurrence. Hence the importance of uh, the uh, patient-reported outcomes in this context. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast.